Now we will wind up the book with section 5 and an analysis of the reform process. Not only do I propose three fundamental measures to be adopted, but I also explain, from a political standpoint, how, at minimal cost, they could be adopted in five stages, which I have outlined in chart 9.1. The chart goes from right to left, and the first stage consists of a system like the current one. In the second stage, some initial banking independence appears and monetary growth falls. In the third stage, a 100% reserve requirement is established, but we still have public money, and growth reaches around 2%. In the fourth stage, bills and deposits are exchanged for gold. And in the fifth stage, a pure gold standard and a 100% reserve requirement are in effect. The stages are analyzed along with the appropriate strategic principles. But I would like to make a couple of observations now. First, in the wake of the exchange and of the monetization of gold, the price of gold would rise significantly, because in addition to the current demand for gold for use in jewelry and industrial processes, as well as the speculative demand, there would be a very strong monetary demand for gold. Different theories have predicted how high the price of an ounce of gold would rise. At present, an ounce of gold costs a little over $1,000. Well, the price could climb to five or ten times that much, and as a result, the exchange would be followed by a monetary shock due to the influx of gold. In other words, gold would come out of the woodwork. Much of the gold we wear as jewelry would be melted down into coins. People would have every incentive to search for gold, even several kilometers underground. So there would be an influx, but just at first, an initial shock. The quantity of gold would increase by maybe 10 or 15 percent, and there would be a preliminary one-time inflationary shock, which is theoretically inevitable, and lasting stability would follow. Second, and this is very important, and one of the most curious byproducts of the system, we will see that the proposed system of transition would enable us to repay the entire national debt at no cost and without inflation all outstanding government debt worldwide. And to a great extent, social security liabilities could even be met. How is this possible? Is Professor Huerta de Soto the promoter of a utopian scheme? No. You will all find this easy to understand if we look at this chart, which reflects the consolidated balance sheet of the assets and liabilities of the banking system after the transition. The transition would be very simple and would consist of issuing the paper currency necessary to back all bank deposits and equipment equivalents 100%. The euros would be printed and given to private bankers, and from that point on, all of their deposits would be perfectly counterbalanced by the newly created money the bankers received and put away in their vaults, and they would maintain a 100% reserve ratio. Now, the question is, what would happen to the assets currently held by the banking system as collateral for deposits, the loans banks grant, both toxic and non-toxic assets? Well, apart from those which correspond to owners is equity, I respect private property, and I do not wish to touch even one euro of what belongs to bank stockholders, though much could be said about this. For over the centuries, they have profited from the process of seniorage. In other words, by operating with a fractional reserve, they have issued money and have made a profit in the process. Anyway, without touching even one euro of what belongs to stockholders, I propose that all of banks' freed assets that are currently counterbalancing deposits and would no longer be necessary necessary, since deposits will be backed 100% by newly created money, I propose these assets be used to establish a set of mutual funds to be managed by the banking system. And who would own the shares? The holders of government bonds issued by all nations. The holders of these bonds would exchange them for the new shares. According to my estimates, there would be enough to repay all the national debt issued by Spain and practically every country. And there would even be money left over to liquidate other government liabilities, the largest of which are connected with the social security system. As is logical, this can be done only once, and only after the irrevocable decision has been made to move to a banking system with a 100% reserve requirement. For if paper currency is issued and handed over to banks as collateral for their deposits, but an irrevocable decision has not first been made to keep to a financial system with a 100% reserve requirement, and for some reason, fractional reserves are re introduced, imagine the pyramid of credit expansion and inflation that could be erected with that newly created money. It would be inflation unlike any we have ever seen. 
and it will be the last straw and would destroy our economic system. All of the measures I propose and the conclusions I draw rest on the irrevocable nature of this reform. Therefore, I close the book with the following message. We must insist that the financial and banking system comply, like every other economic agent, with the general legal principles essential to all market economy.